Can you hear me? Yeah. Move the dial in Toronto. What's up, y'all? Yeah. Okay. That was amazing. Can we give them another round of applause, please? Forgot my clicker. Thank you. All right. I mean, talk about a perfect example of breaking conventionalism. I couldn't have asked to come after uh, a better group of individuals. So look, I am so hey, excited to be here today. Yes, came from, I was in Boston and New York and I came here and it is a blessing to be here. Big shout out to Jody and the entire Move the Dial team. How is this an inaugural summit? This just doesn't happen. Congratulations, can we give them a round of applause again? All right, family, so we've got a lot to get through in a very short amount of time. So I'm gonna speed it up just a little bit, but Damian Hooper Campbell, eBay's first chief diversity officer, so happy to be here. What you're not gonna get today is a nice wrapped Tiffany box with a ribbon that gives you all of the answers for how to tackle the challenges in diversity and inclusion. I'm actually not gonna show you a ton of data on my screen today. What I hope you will walk away with is something that when the going gets rough, you use to pick up and to continue moving forward. So without any further ado, let me do what any good presenter should do, which is tell you what they're gonna tell you. First thing we're gonna do, set some context. Second thing, the meat and potatoes of today, breaking conventionalism. And then the last thing I wanna do is I just wanna give you, for your own spirit, three questions that you absolutely have to ask when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Does that work? Yes? Okay, let's go. How many of you, by a show of hands, have seen the movie Meet the Fokker or Meet the Parents? Okay, beautiful. So in the spirit of inclusion, let me just lay this out for you. Infamous scene in the movie, Robert De Niro is on the right. He's the father of a young woman. He is skeptical about the world. Former CIA agent thinks everybody is out to get him. Ben Stiller is the significant other of Robert De Niro's daughter and is meeting Robert De Niro and his wife for the first time, wants to make a good impression, but poor Ben trips all over himself at every single interval and Robert De Niro is right there to get him. And there's this infamous scene in the movie where Robert De Niro catches him in the hallway and he says, yo, Ben, I'm watching you. And he has this piece of paper and he draws something. Anybody remember what it was called? Say it louder. The circle of trust. And he says, yo, Ben, me and my family, we're inside this circle of trust and you, my brother, are way out there. <laughs> I say that to say that for the next few minutes, I'm pushing you all to go beyond the BS. I'm pushing you all to go beyond the surface level or bringing your representative to these kinds of conferences because that's what we do. I'm pushing you to actually have a real conversation about this topic. So this is the moment for those of you who have been on a plane and you ever been in the exit row and the flight attendant, he comes by and he says, hey, you're in an exit row? Are you okay to be in the exit row? You actually have to like nod or say something. Are we okay to be inside the circle of trust? Yes. Yes. Are we okay to be inside the circle of trust? Yes. Yeah, all right, cool. So if you were to Google diversity and inclusion in technology, this is just a snippet of the headlines that you'd see. You don't believe me, try it. It's no different here in Toronto than it is in the US and primarily across the world. Now, in looking at some of these, somebody like me who's dedicated his life to this work, this can sometimes be discouraging, but the truth is half of it's true and earned, the other half is probably exaggerated. Nevertheless, here's what most companies do to try to tackle this. They spend more money. They hire somebody like me and they say, we got a chief diversity officer, we're wiping our hands clean, we're done. No. Or 
They invest in training. Unconscious bias has become the buzz phrase of the past five years. Go through a 90-minute unconscious bias training, and all of a sudden you are healed from all bias. <laughs> and in the worst scenario, when they don't know if, if you should say, this person is black or African-American, or this person is gay or homosexual, when they don't know and are afraid to offend, instead of saying something and being vulnerable, this is what we do. We say nothing at all. None of these work. And so I would argue that in order for us to actually move the dial on this conversation, we need to look at convention for anyone who can't see, convention is defined as a way in which something is usually done, especially within a particular area or activity. It's a behavior that's considered acceptable or polite to most members of society. Everybody get what convention means? I would argue we know the definition of insanity, doing the same damn thing and expecting a different outcome. Don't do diversity and inclusion the same way it's been done. Look at the statistics. We need to do something different. But, and I am very aware that I self-identify as a man on this stage. I'm a black man in the United States of America. So there are certain challenges that I experience. I'll never know what it means to be a woman in tech. And so I'd be remiss if I said, go and break convention. It's easy. It ain't. And so as we think about breaking convention, which is what I want to inspire each one of you to do, I want to also give you something that hopefully helps in those moments when you want to give up, in those moments where you're like, I'm not seeing the progress, in these moments where you're feeling maybe marginalized, I want to help you to remember something. And here's how I do it. Let me introduce you to a few convention breakers in my world. Number one, my queen, my mother, my single parent mother who raised me and I was a really bad kid, <laughs> Diane Winston. You think I have challenges now? She was a woman of color on Wall Street in the 1980s and still raised me. Still raised me, again, a bad kid, packed up, moved us to Chicago to go and pursue her MBA full time with no income except student loans, and now has been a successful entrepreneur for the past 13 years. She broke convention by bucking the trend, by even when people said, you're a single parent, you can't quit your job and go and get an MBA to further yourself, she did it. Convention breaker number one. Convention breaker number two, my great-grandfather, Papa Letzinger, who during the Great Migration moved from North Carolina up to Metuchen, New Jersey, and opened an NAACP chapter there for the national advancement of colored people, sold cough syrup door to door, was the first in his family to ever have a passport. Folks, this was back in the 20s. You think I got it hard now? This was the 20s. Convention breaker number two. My final convention breaker, my father is from Guyana, South America, considered the Caribbean. Came to the United States when he was 20 years old, met my mom, they got married, later divorced. Well before that, his mother had to leave Guyana because of a political coup, and he was left to be raised by my Aunt Ruth, who became my grandmother. My Aunt Ruth was not only the head of the household as a woman, she was the head of the household as a man. And she was the head of the household, ultimately, and had to do everything by herself in the midst of Guyana, South America, back in the day. She was educated, she ran a business, and raised my father, who wasn't even her biological child. And as you can see, she was a force in field hockey as well. <laughs> my Aunt Ruth, my third convention breaker. When the going gets rough, I think about these people. 
who could have given up. And they inspire me to say they paved the way. And so I want to ask you for the next three minutes to turn to each other. Remember we said circle of trust. And I simply want you to talk very quickly and share who your convention breakers are. Okay? Okay, that's a yes. Go. <laughs> Look at that. I didn't even have to ask y'all to shh. You did it. Well done. I'm going to ask you to do something that's relatively cheesy. So, spoiler alert, we did what we very often do as human beings in conference or corporate settings. As many of you are sitting next to people you may not know and you got real vulnerable. Number one key to diversity and inclusion is vulnerability. Please give yourselves a round of applause. Now, in a perfect world, we'd spend some time and we'd have a few brave folks stand up and share their stories. I ask that you share those throughout the rest of the conference with each other. It's those people who have broken convention and remembering what they went through, remembering when they could have turned left and instead they turned right, and how that blazed a trail for many of us in the room that should give you the fuel to continue fighting even when you don't feel like it. So with that, let me pivot a little bit. At eBay, everything we do, diversity and inclusion, falls into one or more of the following three buckets. Number one, our workforce, who we hire and how we go about doing that. Number two, our workplace, no point in hiring great people, men, women, black, white, if it sucks to work at eBay. And so we gotta spend some time making the place a great place. And then finally, damn it, we've got 175 million buyers from across the globe in eBay, Kijiji, et cetera. Like, we gotta be inclusive of them and the buyers we have yet to even engage with because maybe we haven't been intentional about including them. But these are just words. Let me show you a couple of examples. Number one, workforce. Most people in my role as chief diversity officer have to beg the university recruiting team to go to a historically black college in the United States or to go to a women's college or to go to a Hispanic serving institution in the United States. I don't because we made the strategic decision to have university recruiting report to me. And so over the past two years, by being intentional in our workforce, we've moved the dial when it comes to women in tech as interns from 35% to almost 50%. And we ain't done yet. That's our workforce. Number two, we'd be fools to think that all across the world right now, we're not in a situation that is dividing us along political lines, religious lines, gender lines, race-based lines. And many people will say, well, don't talk about that inside of the company. We don't believe that. We say, damn it, future of work and the places that are gonna really keep it real are gonna run towards these conversations. And so these are posters that were up throughout our campuses recently where we facilitated safe yet uncomfortable places for people to come and talk about everything from I'm conservative to you're liberal. I don't know what it means to have PTSD or to be bipolar. I'm Muslim, you're Christian. And the biggest thing we heard is we wish we had more time to do it. Courageous conversations in our workplace. And finally. My experience buying a wedding dress was awful. I was told that the dresses that I had picked out would not suit my body, nor was I allowed to try them on. And at this point was asked when I was going to lose weight or how I was going to lose weight for my wedding. Trying on dresses that are five sizes too small, that's the start of telling you that you're not good enough. Women of all sizes struggle with how they look. It's almost like a rite of passage that if you're a bride that you just lose weight and that's it. You should be this size, look this way on your wedding day. I mean, you should do whatever you want, it's your wedding day. Clothes is not a reason to lose weight. The clothes should be available to you whatever size you are. The difference between me and a skinny bride is our size, that's it. The wedding should be, I'm going to be getting married to the love of my life and everything else is details. On that day, you honestly will be the most beautiful person 
ever because you will literally just be glowing. You'll be so happy. Love is more than, than what you look like. I don't think there's an ideal size to be a bride. It's what you're comfortable with. If you're a size two, then that's the ideal size. If you're a size 20, that's the ideal size. There's obviously a bigger picture on your wedding day and that's, that's your marriage. If you want to change yourself, change yourself. But if you're doing it to make other people accept you, then that's not positive. Whatever you're comfortable with, whatever your body size is, body type is, if you're happy and comfortable with it, then that's the ideal size. That's our marketplace where we are being intentional. And yes, that had to do with gender, but it also had to do with physical aspects of our diversity. That business is growing at clips higher than the overall business because we're intentional about being inclusive. So as I close, folks, right, we set some context. We talked about my convention breakers. You all talked about your convention breakers. And you got a sense of how we do it at eBay. Three questions that you have to continuously ask yourself if you're serious about diversity and inclusion. Number one, why does or doesn't your CEO care? Not your chief HR officer, not your chief legal officer, the woman at the top, the man at the top, understand why they care personally, not just because it's a business imperative, everybody says that. Why do they personally care or why don't they care? And give them the space and vulnerability to tell you that they don't, and then make it your mission to help them care. Number one, why do or don't they care? Number two, we do a lot of calling people out. On social media, we call people out. Minority groups call majority groups out for getting terminology wrong and saying something. Majority groups call minority groups out because of fear and biases. We hold immense power to free and disarm people to have a human conversation. So the next time somebody says something that maybe offends you, stop for a second, take a beat, assume good intent, and instead of calling them out, call them in to the conversation and try to explore and understand what happened first. If it turns out they were being racist or sexist, then you pounce. <laughs> but let's just take a second and treat each other like human beings. And then the last one, and this is one you guys should be asking yourselves every single day. Are you a convention keeper? or a convention breaker. I would argue that for the simple fact that somebody like me, less than 100 years ago, couldn't go to school with many people who are in this room right now, had to use a separate bathroom than many people who are in this room right now, and that there were people who gave up their lives here in Toronto, across Canada, and across the world for all of us to be enjoying this moment right now. I would argue that no one in this room, regardless of your background, has the luxury of being a convention keeper. And so I challenge you all, walk out of here, think about your breakers, be a breaker. Don't wait for your chief diversity officer, be chief diversity officers. Move the dial. We did this. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference.